today we're going to really spend a little more time in the priestly activities. I guess the um, the idea of a, the sacrifice being better. We've talked about Jesus being our high priest, which is better than the Jewish high priest and that um, system of uh, managing our, their spirituality, dealing with uh, the sacrifices for sin, for all the, the Jews. And now that we have Jesus as our high priest, uh, those things are, we are in a much better situation, uh, according to the Hebrew writer. So today the, the word of encouragement from Hebrews is going to be forgiveness. And that's going to be, we're going to be kind of going through that in light of studying along with the covenant's better sacrifice. So uh, what I would like to do is get a volunteer to read the first 10 verses of chapter 9, and then we will go from there in our study. So Hebrew, okay, Joe, you want to read those of chapter 9, first 10 verses? We'll wait for the microphone. Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread, which is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod, which was budded and the, tab and the tables of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Okay. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle performing all the divine worship. But in the second, only the high priest enters once a year but not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the, the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. Okay. Did you read verse 10 as well? Oh, 10? Yes. Mm -hmm. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. Okay. Thank you, Joe. So um, as we see here opening up, opening up uh, chapter 9, Let's look how that ties in to where we left off last week there at the end of chapter 8. It says, in speaking of a new covenant, it makes the first one obsolete, and while it's becoming obsolete and growing old, is old is ready to vanish away. We saw that last week, talking about the differences in the covenant, the new covenant that uh, God had established through Jesus. And now we're going to, as we move into chapter 9, then we see some detail here in these first 10 verses talking about uh, some a little, little more of a description about the uh, the duties, uh, the temple, the tabernacle, and the duties of the priests and sing, those type of things. And this is where we're going to examine that, and we're going to then do some comparing to what Jesus offers us. And I think it's really important to to understand some of these things. Uh, the, it's briefly mentioned about some of the things that are in the. The tabernacle, the holy place, the most holy place. Um, there's a few things that were brought up, but yet it says here at the end of chapter 5, it says, of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So the writer is not going to go into a long description and, and uh, you know, uh, spend a lot of time on these things, but it's going to bring them up in, in kind of in general uh, terms here. So... So what is the earthly sanctuary mentioned in verse 1? 
talks about an, uh, uh, an earthly place of holiness. So let's start out there. What are we referring to when we're talking about the earthly place of holiness? Yes, the tabernacle. Uh, what the Jews were, were using, obviously it moved into the Solomon's temple later on, but it, in this comparison we're talking about the tabernacle, the things that were set up uh, in the Jewish system of worship and sacrifice. Uh, so the next question on your sheet, what is the purpose of the description of the tabernacle and the duties of the priests in these verses? What are we trying to establish here? What's that? The, the order of things. Okay, absolutely. Vernon, did you have your, did you raise your hand? I thought I saw a hand over here. That it's a pattern for things in the New Testament. Okay. Everything is teaching us something. Yeah. And by going back to this in this chapter, it's establishing the baseline, so to speak, of where the Jews were. What was their uh, system? What meant uh, everything to them and how about how they went about worshiping God? And, and then he's going to talk about that. And then he's going to then move into what is better as far as the sacrifice. You know, the, the Hebrew writer has just been systematically going through every type of thing that the Jews were used to and really explaining how everything involved in the New Testament, in Jesus, in the New Covenant, everything is, a, is better. And we're going to tie that all in here uh, in a little bit. So, um, some words that I want us to think about as we go through this today. Give me your definition of, of the word redeem or redemption. When you think of that word, what, is, what, what would be your definition for redeem or redemption? Anybody have something? Larry? I've always thought about redemption as the idea of be, buying back once something is lost and you repurchase it. And that's what God did for us. Right. That's getting something back. You know, um, one definition I found was gain or regain possession of something in exchange for payment, right? So Jesus was our payment for our souls, right? We were redeemed through what Jesus did for us. So what would you say your definition would be for forgiveness? So we, we've exchanged something for our souls through Jesus. What's for, what would be your definition for forgiveness? Josh? Just the idea that God doesn't hold our sins against us anymore. Yeah. Um, not, that we, not that we haven't sinned, but he doesn't hold those against us. Um, That's anymore. right. It's like a canceling a debt or putting away something, omitting what, what we have done, you know. So we know we've been purchased through Jesus. Now we have forgiveness because of that. So all the sins that we have in our life uh, it, it, are, are put away. When we ask for forgiveness, it, it's forgotten. It's put aside. Um, so when we talk about another word of reformation, which is mentioned in this chapter, in verse 10, what, when you think of the word reformation, what does that mean to you? Yeah. Reform means change for the good. Okay. Change to make something better, right? Um, some words that the, for the, the Bible word for reformation talks about to straighten thoroughly, uh, rectification, restoration, the idea of, of improving something, changing something for the better. So we're going to be talking kind of about the Re Reformation, which is mentioned in verse 10. Uh, it, it's, we're talking about the Jewish system of doing things in verse 10. It says, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. So this is that transition from the Old Testament law and the way of doing things into the law of Christ. And that's what we're going to be looking at, really, that transition uh, through the sacrifices that were made. Uh, so keep those words in mind, redemption, forgiveness, and reformation as we talk about this. It's, it's good to understand 
the Old Testament way of doing things to really get a better grasp on how Jesus is making those things better. So here as we start class, one thing I wanted to do, many times when you study the duties of the priests, the uh, ceremonies in a lot of the, uh, the specific days that uh, God had set up for them, uh, some of the um, feasts and so forth. Can that be a little bit confusing when you think of all the specific duties and the things that had to be done? I thought it seemed to me that way sometimes when I read through it. And I thought, well, I'm going to look at something that gives me a little, a little bit of a visual of how that works. And maybe that will resonate better with me. Maybe it will be you. So what I, we usually don't do this a lot, but what I wanted to do today, I, ha I found a video I want to present. And it really brings to life some of the things that the priests did that we read about here in the first 10 verses. So I'm going to show this to you. We're going to split it up. We'll watch some of the beginning of it, and then we'll have more discussion, and we'll come back to the end and tie that in. But I think that the main thing about this video is it just gives you a really a good visual idea of what's going on to help you grasp this. So I hope this will be helpful. And... Um, Obviously, we realize that this is, you know, produced by man. There are things like that. We have to take that into account. But overall, we'll make sure that the general idea comes across and the visual will help you. So I'm going to get out of the way for a little bit. I'm going to turn it, Ben, run that, and then we'll come back in a little bit to finish up. The Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, is the most holy and solemn day of the Jewish calendar. It is the only day when the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place within the tabernacle and ancient temples. It was the only day when the high priest reconciled Israel with God and symbolically brought them back into the presence of the Lord. No other day and no other ancient ritual comes closer to the full meaning and purpose of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The fall season of festivals begins with Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the Jewish New Year. Rosh Hashanah marks the start of a 10-day period of repentance and preparation for the Day of Atonement. During these 10 days, Israelites would seek to draw closer to God in preparation for these sacred rituals. On the Day of Atonement, all of Israel would be forgiven for their sins of the previous year, thus allowing them to be cleansed and prepared for the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, to occur five days later. Feast of Tabernacles was the final and most joyous of the three major Jewish feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. The Day of Atonement followed a complex yet beautiful ritual, symbolizing that all of Israel now had been forgiven and was able to re-enter the presence of the Lord through the high priest. The ritual began with the high priest, dressed in his normal colorful golden garments, offering the daily morning ritual of sacrifices and burning of incense on the altar of incense. He then would wash his flesh and change into simple white robes. The act of washing and changing clothes would actually occur five separate times throughout the ritual, the wearing of just the white robes could symbolize the Savior, who, leaving his heavenly throne, laid aside all the glory and put upon himself the plain robe of humanity, becoming like one of us. The color of white is also a powerful symbol of purity, representing the absolute purity of the true great high priest, even Jesus Christ. Next, the high priest would bring two goats into the tabernacle or temple and cast lots for each of them. One lot was for Azael, or the scapegoat, and the other was for the Lord. A red ribbon was tied around the horns of the scapegoat to distinguish it from the other goat. The high priest would then take a bullock, or young bull, and place his hands on its head, symbolically transferring his own sins and the sins of his fellow priests to the bull. He would then slit the throat of the bull and catch the blood in a dish to be saved for later services. 
He then would bring a burning coal from the altar of sacrifice and incense into the Holy of Holies through the veil for the first time. Here dressed in all white, the high priest would burn the incense before the Lord. The room would fill with smoke, the cloud of smoke often being a symbol of the presence of God. The high priest then would exit the Holy of Holies, wash again, and take the blood of the bull and re-enter the Holy of Holies for a second time. He would then sprinkle seven times the blood of the bull on the Ark of the Covenant. The shedding of the blood of the young bull represented that the high priest was forgiven and reconciled to enter into the presence of the Lord. The high priest would then kill the goat that was chosen for the Lord, again saving the blood in a dish. He then would enter the Holy of Holies with this blood for the third and final time. As he did before, he would sprinkle the blood of the goat seven times before the ark. As the goat was the offering for the people, this act of bringing its blood into the Holy of Holies represented that all of Israel was symbolically able to enter the presence of the Lord through the high priest and because of the shedding of the blood of the sacrifice. Just as the high priest could only enter by blood, so too it is only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that we can enter God's presence. As the high priest exited the Holy of Holies, he would then sprinkle the combined blood of the bull and the goat before the veil of the tabernacle. He would also use the blood to cover the four horns of the altar of incense. The remaining blood would be poured out at the base of the altar of sacrifice in the outer court. The high priest would then return to the scapegoat and place his hands upon its head, symbolically transferring the sins of all of the people to the goat. He then would utter the sacred name of the Lord, which was never to be said except on this holy day. O Jehovah, I entreat thee, your people the house of Israel, has been iniquitous, sinned, and erred before you. O then, Jehovah, cover over, I entreat thee, upon their iniquities, their transgressions, and their sins. The goat was then taken outside of the tabernacle and led into the wilderness. The guiltless goat, dependent upon its owner for its care and protection, would become lost and die in the desert. Perhaps no symbol of the Savior is more powerful than the scapegoat. Innocent of any wrongdoing, just like this goat, the Savior has had laid upon him the sins of the world. As Isaiah so beautifully stated, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Modern readers often gloss over the significance of the Day of Atonement as simply an outdated, archaic ritual of death and covering of blood. However, as one better understands each of the aspects, it teaches a powerful message of the Atonement of Jesus Christ. The word Atonement, or Kafar in Go Hebrew, actually oh, means to cover. Thus... All right, thank you. Now... I hope that helped give you a good visual that you can think about this. What's your first impression when you see that showing some things about these sacrifices from the Old Testament priest? What's the, what's, what is your first impression, your first thought when you look through that? Anything? Vernon. The detail and the... Um fastidiousness, I can't think of a, a better word for what they had to go through to get rid of sin. Right. What was one thing that jumped out at you that we've discussed a little bit when it comes to the high priest? I think Lewis has a comment first and then Joe. Just the idea of how reverent it is. Mm -hmm. Solemn. Very solemn. A lot of specific things that had to be followed just a certain way by God's plan, right? Certain things had to happen a certain way. Joe? Well, it compares to certain things that had to happen when Jesus was born, died on the cross for us, and was resurrected. It was all in God's plan. Mm -hmm. It all ultimately was, was in God's plan. 
the good thing that we see here when we're talking about the comparison of this is, is really it's good to know the Old Testament way of doing things because it is just, it is a, what is it referred to when, we talk, when it talks about the old law? It is a what? Shadow. A shadow. It's a type. It helps us to understand. It helps us really understand fully the background of now understanding what Jesus has done and continues to do for us. What's interesting, we're going to look down into verse 8 here of chapter 9. I want to talk about this. It says, when we talk about the, some of the things we just saw in the video, about some of the things that the priests do, and, and, but once a year, as we talked about with the Day of Atonement we saw in the video. Uh, it says, by, the, by this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. What do you get out of that verse when it talks about the way into the holy places is not yet opened? Who could, who could only go in to the, just the holy place or into the temple courtyard in the old law? Who, who could only go there? The priest, right? Yeah. Yeah, just the high priest. Yeah, the high priest no, could go into the holy of holies, the most you know, holy place in the presence of God. You see how reverent he was as he was coming into that to, to sprinkle the blood and so forth. And then yet the, into the holy place, the high priest and the priest could go. But even just the regular Jew was not allowed inside any of that. And so it says, you know, the way into the holy places is not yet open as long as the first section is still standing. What is the first section that's still standing? Yeah. What's that? The old covenant, the, the, the symbolized through the, the tabernacle, right? We're going to see how that's been taken away here. But it says... You know, the other thing it says here is according to this arrangement, which we saw, the gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. So we can't enter to the holy place because of what's still standing, the Jewish law, the Jewish way, and it does not perfect the conscience of the worshiper. So those are things that shows what about this old system. Josh? Yeah. Something better if uh, if it was permanent, we wouldn't look ahead to something better. And, and I think that's one of the whole themes of, of Hebrews. Don't put your trust in the shadow. Yep. Jesus is the substance. Don't put your trust in the symbol. Jesus is the reality of the symbol. That's right. Um, so he's trying to use all these symbols to point to Jesus. Point, absolutely pointing to Jesus. We're, we talked about the conscience. Um, you know, it, we said that the, the old law cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper from verse 9. If you look over to verse 15, um, it, where was it? I just had it there. <laughs> No, sorry, verse 14. It says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Even comparing the conscience, it perfects us where the old law couldn't. Um, what was something that you saw in the video that, and that's required for a sacrifice? Blood and why is blood so important? It, it, the life is in the blood. For any type of sacrifice coming to God, it requires blood. It required blood to, for the sacrifice for the bull for the sins of the high priest. It was the goat, for the blood of the goat for Israel. Those had to be brought in to God. And so for a more perfect sacrifice, again, what's required? The blood of Christ, isn't it? And that's what it says here. Um, the blood of Christ. How much more will the blood of Christ uh, basically um, purify our conscience from dead works? So that is important that the blood is a, uh, can't happen without blood to have a, 
uh, a sacrifice. The other thing, verses, verse 12 and 15, which we haven't read yet, but if you look down here, I'll go ahead and read these two verses. Well, let me go ahead and start. I'll read, start at verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, which we're talking about the more perfect tent, the one not made with hands of this creation. We're not talking about the earthly tabernacle. We're talking about um, you know, heaven and, and things spiritual. He says that he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. Okay. He entered how many times? Once. He didn't have to do this every year. He didn't have to continue to make sacrifices. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And it says, what is it secure for us in this verse? Eternal redemption. What did the sacrifice of the priests do for the people? Help them. It, it, it was done for the forgiveness of sins. But what, where did it fall short compared to Christ? Yeah. Christ was the perfect sacrifice. Right. Perfect so, lamb. Yeah, the, the old way did not provide the eternal redemption. Jesus was the only one that could do that. It says, um, it, the securing the eternal redemption... And also over in verse 15, it says, Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive what? Not just the internal inheritance, but the promised eternal inheritance. So we have a much greater reward, don't we, through Christ. It's eternal. It's forever. Uh, it could not be uh, offered through uh, the old law. Again, we talked about the blood being essential for forgiveness. Blood is in is the life. It must be given for redemption. And Christ's blood is superior to the the blood of the bulls and goats. Again, we see what do we see? Some copies. When we talk about shadow or copies or a type of these things that you saw here, how what are some things that you think of with Christ that you see uh, that's compared to the shadow of some of these rituals and things like that? Go ahead, Jessica. Um, with with the previous law, there had to be continuous blood sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. With Jesus uh, or Christ, his sacrifice was one time for the rest of, I guess, until the end of, of time as we know here on earth, that once we're baptized into his blood, we can continue to be forgiven without having to keep making those sacrifices repeatedly. That's right. And by Jesus being our high priest, what do we have access to that the Jews didn't? Symbolically. The most holy place. We're able to access God in a way that none of the Jewish people were able to, to access him. The high priest had to do it for them. They had to do all these things to uh, take care of the sins of the people. But we have access. It's like we are able to enter the holy place because we have Jesus as our high priest. We are priests. And we have that unique relationship now that's set up with God through Christ that couldn't have happened through the old law. Um, so what, I guess, what did Jesus have to give up to provide us that forgiveness? He had to give what? His life and his, his blood. He had to give up everything, right? The question I have is, what must we often need to give up to receive forgiveness? Jesus had to give up something, and now our requirement is that we, what we have to give up things, right? What, what is necessary for us to give up to receive that forgiveness? Yes, Connie? Okay, our former life, we have to sacrifice that. We can't continue to live a life separated from God. 
live a life that has sin in it. We cannot do that. That, that we have to sacrifice that. So we're, we have a part in this as well. Go ahead, Lewis. Similar idea. We had to give up our will for his will. Our will, okay. So yeah, our part in this is not without our own sacrifice. Our will, and that's one of the hardest things to give up is our will. You know, in a way, that's a continual sacrifice on our part, isn't it? That we have to give up our will. Um, we want to serve ourselves, but we see Jesus serving us, and so we need to be willing to serve him and give up something on our own. Anything else that you can think of that you might add to something we have to give up? What gets in the way of that? Sometimes do it. does our pride get in the way of giving up things? Our, again, our will, we don't want to sacrifice ourselves. We are told to be what? Slaves, okay. We are slaves. We can be, we can give up everything or to God and follow Him, or we can be slaves to sin and Satan. Right? We have choice. Uh, but we are told that we are to present ourselves as what? Living sacrifice. So as we live our lives, we're always going to find things that we have to try to, to determine that it's we have to sacrifice that to please God. There's always going to be things like that's coming up in our life. Vernon. It struck me in the video the the violence of the change, of the violence of forgiveness, the blood to be offered, the death, the it, it paints a picture in my mind of how bad sin is, uh, which of course is magnified by many times when you place Christ as the one that receives the violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is the one that that went through all that pain that you might have seen through the bulls and the goats and what they had to be sacrificed there. Christ was symbolically that for us by what he went through. And it's, it's, it's just amazing to see the comparisons that, that are a part of that. Let's go on over. I'm going to skip over here. Um, okay, so I'm going to read verse 18 starting there. It says, therefore not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. Again, that's common to all those sacrifices. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves, goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprick, sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of, of the covenant that God commanded for you. And we can see, as we saw in the video, all these things that had to be sprinkled with blood. But verse, skipping down to verse 23, thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things the things that was in the Old Testament, the copies of the things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on what? Our behalf. Right? So all these things are just so much better through Christ. Again, it talks about uh, Jesus did not have to offer himself repeatedly uh, and those type of things like that. But it says at the end of verse 26, But as it is, he has appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is important for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So he's already been here to take care of sin and make provisions for that for us. And when he comes again, it will be to take us home with him. Um, it's so important. What, um, so what's your thoughts on that? When you see what Christ has done, well, how should we respond to that in our lives? How should that in inspire us to to live our lives better for him. Jessica? Um, it makes me think of something when, when I was like in Bible class when I was a kid. I remember them, somebody talking about every time that we sin, it's like putting Jesus back on the cross and him suffering again. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if, you know, it's that when we purposely sin now that 
Christ remembers that, like, a, you know, or if it's that while he was there, he felt every sin that was to come. I'm guessing more like that. But either way, I think when we think of it that way, we should try to focus that when we're tempted to sin, that first we think, do we want to add that pain to Christ? Do we, do we want to cause him to suffer again when we could avoid that? Right. It's important that we, that's why we have this, that we have the Lord's Supper every week. It helps remind us of that. One thing that really also jumped out at me when you think about Jesus in the garden, you know, when the high priest, they had the outer courtyard, they had the whole the holy place and the most holy place. It, one thing that was interesting that came uh, in, in my study was thinking about how Jesus uh, approached his prayer in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had all the disciples with him, or all his apostles with him. And then he took Peter, James, and John and went a little bit farther with them. And then he went a little bit farther on to just be with himself as he prayed to God. And it's almost like that was symbolic of the outer courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy place. When Jesus was in the presence and praying to God, it's almost like it was a symbol of that. It's real, that was just interesting to me to think about how Jesus is already acting on our behalf as he's getting in close uh, conversation with God. And you see so many benefits that we have through Christ uh, as we compare the two. Larry, and then we'll probably be out of time. Go ahead. One of the thoughts that came to mind with what Jessica was saying is the song that we often sing, uh, I'm the One. Uh, we've sung it here a few times, but that gives you a guilty feeling that we put Jesus back on the cross whenever we commit sin. Mm -hmm. And I think that song portrays that very thought. Yeah, it's almost like he's already taking care of that for us, but we're trying to force him back to do it again in a way, right? Every time when we let sin in our lives, we're just thankful that he's done what he has done for us.